UI programming is one of those things that has some weird unintuitive quirks to it, but once you learn those quirks, you can work with them fairly quickly. Today, I'll walk you through how to create UIs and control them with code, as well as how to properly change client UI from the server. To start, UI elements, go and start a GUI. Shocker, I know. But there's one specific property of screen GUI objects that I want to make a note of, reset on spawn. There is a time and a place for this to be enabled, but for our purposes, we're going to want to disable this. If we have a script running and suddenly all of the UI elements get replaced and all of our connections and references are now nil, the script is going to crash really fast. Once we've created our incredible UI that's definitely a work of art, we need to program it. Since it's on the client, we'll need a local script. But where do we put it? Inside of the starter GUI, right? Wrong. If we put our code inside of the starter GUI, it'll get replaced whenever the player responds. The most standard place to put UI code is in starter player scripts, which is underneath the starter player folder. All right, finally we're programming. Uh, let's change the text of the text box to something dumb, it doesn't matter. We'll change the text the same way we would change any property of any object. And when we run it, we see that it doesn't work. It didn't error though. Uh, we're going about this wrong. Starter GUI isn't like workspace in that we can change something and it shows that change to the player, but rather it's a template that gets copied to the player's screen when they spawn in. Imagine that you've got a nice drawing and people are coming by and taking pictures of it. If you keep drawing and changing things on your piece of paper, that doesn't change what's on the snapshots. People would have to come back and take new snapshots in order to get those changes. So where are the snapshots being saved? In the player GUI. If we start the game and open the player object, you can see the player GUI is a direct descendant and all of the GUI contents we would expect are inside. We can adapt our code to work properly by changing the path to reference the folder inside of the local player. Now you might notice that I called wait for child a bunch of times instead of referencing the objects directly. And there's a reason for that. Client scripts can often execute before the player's components are finished replicating, meaning you can't always expect UI components to be in place at runtime. When it comes to doing pretty much any kind of UI work, wait for child is your friend. And once your hands start hurting after typing it out 50 times, it becomes your enemy and you make your own function to replace it. I've linked that below. You're welcome. Alrighty, our code is working now. Very nice. Let's use what we've learned to make a simple message broadcast system. On the server, I'll make a script and make a variable to hold our message. I want this to be something important, something really poignant that makes you think. There we go. And now I'll just loop through all the players and change the text using all the best practices we've outlined so far. Except, this is quite possibly the worst way to do this. Expecting all the clients to have decent connection speed and completely loaded UI is like having five unemployed roommates and expecting all of them to pay their share of the rent on time when your name's on the lease. And also, one of them takes two weeks to respond to your texts. It ain't happening, basically. There's other issues with this too, like since the loop yields to wait for each client to be loaded, it's very possible that a client can leave while the loop is executing, so when it gets to them, it breaks the script. Also, client-side UI changes don't replicate back to the server, so if the server opens a menu for the player, and there's a client-side script controlling the close button, the server won't be able to open the menu again because it will eternally perceive it as already open. Yes, it's technically possible to circumvent all this stuff with p-calls and coroutines and sanity checks out the wazoo, but the amount of effort it takes to implement all that stuff is significantly less than the effort it would take to learn the proper way to do it. Remotes. For some reason, learning remotes is considered to be daunting, but it's actually no more complex than any other API. The hardest part is remembering which function to use, and if you have the dev hub open, it's not that hard. For contacting the client from the server, you'll want to use a remote event. The function we'll be using is fire all clients, which will let us send the message to every player with a single function call. We could use fire client if we only wanted to send a message to one player, or fire server if we wanted to send a message from the client to the server. Let's add a remote event to replicated storage, which is a container that can be seen by the client and the server, and make a variable pointing to it. Then we can call the fire all clients function passing through the message. Look at how clean that is. Now on the client, we will again make a variable pointing to the remote. Then we can connect to on client event like we would any other event and set the display text as what we received from the server. There's also on server event, which can be used to detect messages sent from the client to the server. Our broadcast system is now perfect. There's no scenario in which our server sided code will error, which is important because as anybody who has managed a game at scale will tell you, every scenario you can imagine will happen and more. So now you know how to make UI on Roblox, and when you discover Roact, you'll have to learn it all over again.
Still around? Cool, let's talk about remote functions. I wanted to keep the main lesson short and sweet, but remote functions are a good thing to have on your tool belt as well. Basically, a remote function is a remote event, except you can receive something back from whichever site you called. This does mean that there are some limitations, including the script calling the function will yield until a result is returned, only one script can be listening to the remote at a time on either end, and you can't call it for all clients at once. Actually, you just shouldn't call it for clients at all. Similar to our bad way of changing UI from the server, calling the client with a remote function is expecting them to be able to receive the call and return the correct result, which definitely won't happen 100% of the time. If you need to get client data, just uh, have it send the data through a remote event every once in a while, or if you need it at specific times, have the server ping the client with a remote event and have the client set up to send back the data through the remote event when pinged. Okay, let's actually code it. Uh, we're gonna make a system where the client asks the server for the message. Go ahead and drop a remote function into replicated storage. On the client, we'll reference the remote in a variable and then use a function called invoke server to get the data we need and save the response to a variable. We can then put the response we get into the text label. Nice. And yes, there's the invoke client function I mentioned earlier. And if you use this, you're doing it wrong. On the server, we'll once again reference the remote with a variable. And here's the tricky part. Instead of connecting to some kind of event, we're going to set the onServer invoke callback like it's a property with an equal sign and provide the function to run when the server is invoked. The function technically receives a player argument, but we don't need that since our script is simple. And now we've got a thing. That's it. That's the video.